G'day, my name's Karina Way and welcome to Behind the Words. In this episode, we explore the ambiguous Australian icon that is Ned Kelly. We've all heard of him, but who was Ned Kelly? Joining us today on Behind the Words is Mark McIntyre, set designer and writer on Ned, a new Australian musical. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Behind the Words. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course, it's an absolute pleasure. So why do you think it's taken so long for a musical about Ned Kelly to be realised? Well, there has been a, there's been a rock opera in the 70s, which was pretty out there and very, it's got a very 70s vibe to it. <laughs> um, I think our version, of, particularly music-wise, it's a very epic, grand kind of almost operatic in, um, in style. I don't know why no one's, not many people have tackled it. I would think it's a really strong subject matter um, that everyone's familiar with. I think it's just scary. I think people are really scared by writing something about, you know, someone who people consider our greatest Australian icon and that there's so much controversy about him and people are polarised whether they love him or whether they hate him. And so I think it's the subject matter that people have stayed away from. I believe that there's been quite a long history with your production of this show that it's been going for quite a number of years now. What's your involvement been from the beginning, Mark? Well, so I think it's been going something like four years now. Wowza. Um, and we anticipated right at the start, you know, we, we sort of thought, okay, we'll start writing this show now and surely it'll be up by the end of the year. You know, just thinking, <laughs> having no idea of the full process of what it takes to write a musical and new Australian work and, you know, just thinking, oh, surely it's start of next year, you know, but everything will be fine. And at that stage, you know, we hadn't prepared anything of, we weren't prepared for the scale of the production what we were going to do with it. So our very stupid, you know, shall we say, our virgin ideas were a little ill-conceived, time-wise. And the road is begun. Just pile up the sleepers and tighten the gauge. Then stomp on the ballast and begin once again. Adam came to me, who's the composer, Adam Wine. He came to me with the idea for, he had this song that he'd written, he liked it, and it was sort of very much about an Irish father singing to his son. And it seemed really pretty and really nice. And then he thought that we could attach it to the story of Ned Kelly and have Ned's father singing to his son. So that's sort of the where we started. And he said, we should do this show. I said, you're crazy. You know, but here we are, <laughs> four years later, still crazy, but... And so why do you personally want this story to be told? Was it because you had such a connection with Adam's music or do you have a personal connection yourself? Well, I love the music, you know, it's great. The music's sensational. I grew up in regional Victoria, so there's something that... I had always taken for granted with the story. I think it's just, you know, it's just stuff that we knew and, you know, it's always talked about in, you know, the community every now and then, but it's a very much taken for granted thing like, oh yeah, Ned Kelly was through here and oh, this is where the Glen Rowan is and blah, blah, blah. And you just kind of... Become immune? It, it, become immune to it, yeah, when you grow up in that kind of environment. So 
I think it just, after I took a step back and went, hang on, this is a pretty epic, great story. Once I found out more about it, and, you know, we did so much research, um, and there is so much research to be done. There's so much conflicting information. That's the thing for every fact. There's an opposing point of view as to whether people were even in that location at that time or you're looking at police reports and then you're looking at um, what Ned Kelly's derildery letter and they're both conflicting information and it's hard to, you have to come up with your own conclusion and logical sequence of events as to what you think. It's a little bit CSI, you know, a little bit LA law, kind of, <laughs> bit of detective work kind Net of there. musical does CSI. <laughs> Love it. N-C-I-S-N-E-D. Yeah. N-E-D. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up the letter. What's the proper pronunciation? The Gerildery letter. Gerildery. Gerildery. Okay, yep. excellent. Because we were having a read of that and Ned seems to have a really playful way with words. And I'd just like to read a small example. Brooke E. Smith, Superintendent of Police. He knows as much about commanding police as Captain Standish does about mustering mosquitoes and boiling them down for their fat on the back blocks of the Lachlan, for he has a head like a turnip. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go about capturing that language in the script? Well, so, yeah, we used a lot of influences of the Drillery letter yeah. and we basically... What we ascertained from that letter is that he's a fair bit of a smart ass, you know, he's a bit of a larrikin and a bit of a smart <laughs> ass. It shows his absolute disdain for the police and like, you know, lack of respect for authority and everything. So we kind of, I think we've gone a, a contemporised version slightly of the smart ass so people can understand Ned in the context of today as being a real kind of, can I say, F you? But <laughs> I didn't say F you. I'm saying, gosh, we won't take your authority, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, just really kind of like a kid today who just doesn't, you know, very anti-establishment and um, feel oppressed and feel like no one understands them. And so they carry out in little smart-ass ways. I wanted to have a chat too about the fact that this is a musical format and it's perhaps mm. one of the most difficult to difficult medium to convert a historical figure into a theatrical character. Oh, yeah. What challenges did you find with that? I mean, I guess, you know, you touched on it just now, but... Well, whenever you're writing any musical, when you... They've got to sing, yeah? <laughs> so that's yeah, always... usually. Yeah, <laughs> that's always a challenge in itself when you go... Okay, Ned Kelly, how's it going to go with Ned Kelly, the character, singing? It's like that going to be a little bit, you know, if we've got this tough guy, you know, do we then want him bursting into song? Mm -hmm. And so navigating those kind of, those things where, he, where we're not destroying character with the genre of the musical, it's very interesting territory that I think we've successfully, uh, we've managed to <laughs> overcome that hurdle. But, yeah, that's really tricky. Because a lot of people love him or love the idea, there's so many Ned fans out there that it's, wow, they're full <laughs> on. It's full on. You think like Star Trek fans are full on, but Ned Kelly fans are like die hard. Wow. So, you know, you don't want to offend the, <laughs> offend the die hard Ned fans and turning him into this all singing sequin festive <laughs> music theatre kind of thing. Why do you think we glorify him? Why do you think as Australians we love to barrack for the underdog? And I think because we don't actually know the story um, and we feel compelled to make a choice. I think we feel compelled. We don't... Kind of like what I said before about taking things for granted. So people will base their information and feel obliged to make a choice to, that they have to say that he's a hero or a villain. And I think that ambiguity creates sort of myth. The not knowing is what um, probably has turned him into a little bit of the icon that he is today, just through the myth and... Um, Draws everybody in. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, if we knew the facts, if we knew 100% for the facts, he'd be gone by now, you know, the memory would be gone and it, it'd be written in a history book, but it'd be there, you know, it's the fascination of the people who are famous have always died in 
controversial white, like Marilyn Monroe, who you might be familiar with <laughs> for the show Nude, yes? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> a little plug there for Karina. Cheers. Um, so her death is controversial and nobody knows exactly what happened. So that creates, that ambiguity creates myth in the same way that because people don't know what happened with Ned Kelly, creates different opinions and that's where people start talking about it and that's where I think where the myth and the legend part comes into it. Have you found that the process of workshopping this over a number of years and the constant rehearsals have slightly diluted the truth from perhaps where it began? Oh, have we taken liberties with the truth? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> For dramatic context, For dramatic course. purposes, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, on a practical level, we have to... Um, Make it there entertaining. Has to, yeah, well, <laughs> there has to be composite policemen, for example. We can't have 140 policemen on stage shooting out at the end. Don't have quite so, the budget for that, hey? No, <laughs> no. Um, so there are a couple of composite characters, but the main, the main crux of um, the Kelly family and the Kelly gang, we've gone with the information that's there um, and then built upon that. But sure, we've taken liberties. Yeah, so with, um, with the character Steve, Steve Hart, so he's, the only thing we have historically from him is uh, we have attributed to him a saying that he's to a short life but a merry one. So that's been our, you know, our one historical basis for him. And from that line, you know, we've had to extract a character and build that from that. So um, there are liberties that we take with historical content. So he becomes very much, you know, the adventurous kind of playful boy who's a bit impetuous. Um, go get him. Yeah, go get him and <laughs> let's get out there and have fun kind of attitude with Steve. So. And so I believe also that quite a bit of the story is centred around the women in Ned's life. And yeah. How do you find that's shaped the script and the story itself? Because that's quite unusual to bring, make the women of his life. I wouldn't think they'd be quite a large part of it. I think... It's sort of paramount to the story. I feel like the women are the part. I loved writing the parts for the women. Like I, I just, I got, I got so much joy out of being able to tell the story from their side because I think their role in it is so important for Ned's motivation for everything. Like basically everything that Ned does is for his mum, you know, to get his mum out of prison. And she's such a strong influence on him. And, you know, as a single mum, and he suddenly becomes the man of the house at 12, you know, she's obviously had such a huge impact on his choices and decision-making skills and, and how he copes being the man of the house at 12. And you put that into a contemporary context. And, you know, but, it's pretty really accessible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but at 12, I, I don't know what I was doing at 12, but it certainly wasn't very, wouldn't have been hard work and it wouldn't have been responsible and I wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been looking after a family. And then his sisters uh, are incredible. Maggie and Kate, they did all this cool to help support him while, while he was out in the bush. So there's stories of like, to outsmart cops and stuff who were coming to track them. So, um, Kate put horseshoes on backwards so that as she was going this way, they thought she was coming from another direction. And that's really cool. That's a really cool idea. How to what a out badass. Yeah, how to outsmart black trackers and stuff like that and the police. story from the women's perspective and I think they're just so vital and such a strong influence on Ned. Yeah. I read that Ned's mother perjured herself under oath to protect him while she was being interviewed. That's a pretty intense thing. Yeah, um, again that's one of those things that you don't know whether it's fact or fiction mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, but 
she, it would seem that she did allow herself to go to prison, risk her son's being arrested. Um, what that a lady. She, so she, and here's a lady who has a two-week-old baby who is apparently, so that she's attempted murder on a policeman with a two-week-old child, you know. That's, and she's apparently defended the policeman's unwanted advances on her daughter. So, you know. Oh, those Kellys got into some trouble. They're, uh, they're a tough old uh, mob. What does Ned Kelly represent to you? Ooh, what does Ned Kelly represent to me? Mm, I still have two opinions. Obviously, when you are, if you do the crime, you do the time, you know, certainly that. Um, and he did some pretty bad stuff. And that's kind of unforgivable, I think. You can't go um, trying to get a train full of policemen to go off the railroads and kill a whole, the whole Victorian police force. That's uh, not acceptable and... It makes him a pretty hardcore murderer. It didn't happen, but it could have. That was the intention for the Glen Rowan siege, yeah. I think for me, the thing about Ned Kelly is that when people are in certain circumstances from certain socioeconomic backgrounds, when, you, when you're not given liberties and you're not given choice and you don't have freedom, as we understand all those things today and take for granted. If we have to fight for those things, then if it's at the expense of your family, then you just kind of do whatever you can to support your family and friends. You know, the important thing for me is just about the lack of choice and the, the lack of, um, uh, you know, lack of education, money, uh, broad cultural experience. Not having those choices makes people do desperate things. And I think it still does today. The same, it's a history repeating itself kind of thing. You know, um, people given lack of choice will still go to desperate measures to protect themselves. Self-preservation, I guess. Absolutely. So. Well, there you have it, everybody. Ned, an ordinary man, an extraordinary legend. Michael McIntyre, thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Words. Thank you. Thank you. Such is love.